Welcome to OutDrive, folks. I'm your host, Cliff Callis, and each week I'm bringing you actionable marketing insights you can apply to reach, connect with, and convert rural American consumers. OutDrive is powered by Callis, a full-service advertising agency with a focus on marketing rural America. Callis offers a wide range of integrated marketing services, including website development, search engine marketing, social media, video, and digital. We develop strategic and creative campaigns to build your brand and your business. And you can learn more about us at ecalis.com. Now join me in the front seat as we head out on the road to success. Let's go. Hey folks, welcome to OutDrive. We've got another great story to share with you today about life and work in rural America. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by R.J. Lindstrom, president of Zephyr Manufacturing. R.J. is the fourth generation of his family to own and operate his 96-year-old company, which manufactures brooms, mops, brushes, and other cleaning products. Learn what it takes to be successful in business, how they've survived and thrived over the years, and why R.J. is happy to be living and working in rural America. Welcome to OutDrive, R.J. Thanks for having me, Cliff. Excited to be here. Well, I'm excited that you're here as well. I know that we have a lot to talk about today in your fourth generation of a very successful industrial manufacturer. And we certainly want to talk about that and the challenges and, and opportunities ahead and you know what it takes to really run a successful business today and talk about some B2B marketing that you guys do. And certainly I want to get your take on living and working in rural America since it's something you've done most of your life. But for those people who don't know R.J. Lindstrom, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Born and raised here in Sedalia, Missouri, part of a family business, Zephyr Manufacturing. I manufacture mops and brooms right here in Sedalia, Missouri. But grew up here, went off to college, met my wife in Kirksville, Missouri, going to Truman State University. Lived in St. Louis for a couple of years and then in 2008, moved back home, started working for the family business and eventually started running the family business and then bought it for my dad a couple of years later and been doing that for about the last 10, 15 years. Well, time really flies. So as you were growing up, was it a foregone conclusion that you were going to go into the family business? Actually, it was pretty much the opposite. My dad and my family, we kept personal life very separate from the business life. And other than one summer working in the factory, doing some pretty boring work for a 16 year old kid. I never really knew much about the family business in the grand scheme of things. And when both my sister and I went to college, we were told you go to college, you get a degree that you want and you get a job that you want. And there's absolutely no chance that you're getting hired at the family business whenever you graduate. So go do your own thing. And then we'll talk later if there's an opportunity to come work for the family business, but absolutely not right after college. So that's how I ended up in St. Louis for three years working for Enterprise Rent-A-Car, renting cars and doing their management trainee program for three years. And then at that point, we had that conversation and decided to move home and start working for the family business. I really think that's a great perspective because it does give you sort of an outside look at things that you're not going to get any other way. Mm -hmm. You studied business and psychology at Truman State. How do you think that prepared you for the role you're in today? It worked out pretty well, actually. I always had a fascination with psychology and uh, really enjoyed it. So those were the classes that I kind of wanted to take, but I knew I wasn't going to go do clinical psychology or anything like that, you know, post four-year degree. So I kind of thought if I marry that up with a business degree, uh, management, they kind of work really well together. You get a lot more insights into how people think and work and some of the psychology behind human behavior really helps you in the future whenever you get to a position where you're managing people and working with people of all kinds and all stripes. It allows me to put myself in a much better position for empathy and management with pretty much anybody. So that management development program and enterprise had to be pretty beneficial. That was another pretty lucky stroke on my part. They do a really fantastic job of training management people in a job that you wouldn't think really requires that much of it, but they really bring a lot of people in to enterprise and they work you pretty hard, but you get to do a lot of things at a very young age. So in three years, I was moved up to assistant manager. I'd worked at 
four or five different locations in the St. Louis area, was in charge of a whole PL statement, had hired and fired people, made a budget, done all sorts of things. By the time I was 26, 27, pretty fresh out of school. And I got to bring a lot of that experience to Zephyr, which was also extremely beneficial because one of the reasons why my dad didn't want to hire me straight out of college is he wanted me to have that outside experience and not only know the way that he's always done it or the way Zephyr's always done it, that there's other ways to do business. So Enterprise gave me a lot of those tools and I brought those back and applied some of them at Zephyr. So did you start applying them right away? Were there things that you recognized almost immediately that maybe needed to change things that your dad had been doing a certain way or just that the company from an organizational point of view had been doing a certain way? There's always, you know, kind of the low hanging fruit whenever you come in and, you know, and of course I worked at Zephyr for two years before I was in charge of anything. I was just learning from the ground up while I was there. But as soon as I could, yeah, there's things I changed, the easy things. And then there were, of course, the things I wanted to change that look like easy solutions or easy fixes that once you get into the problem, they turned out not to be easy at all. And there probably is a reason that we've been doing it that way for, you know, 90 years. (laughs) The 28 year old kid might not know better than all that experience. So tell us about Zephyr Manufacturing. Zephyr has a very long history, so I'll try to keep it relatively short. But my great-grandfather started the company in 1927, actually in his garage in Kansas City, selling brooms. And he grew that business and, and moved it to Sedalia in the 40s and primarily manufactured upright corn brooms and sold those in the Midwest region. And eventually added mops to the product selection. So we started sewing mops and constructing deck mops, that sort of thing. And, you know, my grandfather ran the company from the 40s and 50s up until the 80s when my dad took over. And in 1982, the company acquired several other businesses along the way, added product lines, that sort of thing. And in the 90s, there was a big change with the products we were able to sell because of NAFTA came on board and really changed the market for upright corn brooms. There's a lot of competition with that product out of Mexico and NAFTA eliminated a tariff that pretty much made it impossible to profitably manufacture corn brooms in the U S anymore. So we stopped selling corn brooms then to this day, primarily a a mop manufacturing company. Everything we make is sewing machine based. I came to work for the company in 2008 took over in 2010 and have been running it since then. In 2017, we actually purchased another company out of Arkansas. Kind of the neat story about that is they were still manufacturing a single corn broom in their factory and had a very strong customer base for that. So when we acquired that company, we were able to start manufacturing brooms again in our factory and selling American-made brooms to customers that kind of demand or really want that made in America quality and that don't want imported products. So, you know, kind of came back full circle 20 years later that we're able to manufacture and sell corn brooms again. So that kind of offered you a new distribution channel as well, right? The consumer? Yeah. Direct to consumer, which is not our normal business model. Our main model is selling to distributors and wholesalers in the janitorial supply industry. So our distributors are going to sell the product at least one more time to an end user. Those end users are commercial industrial users, bars, restaurants, hotels, schools, hospitals, that sort of thing, building service contractors. So when we started making that broom and selling it to direct to consumer, that was kind of a new channel. And it also brought with it some additional business through hardware store channel, which is also, it's a whole different way of doing business than the commercial industrial channel. So how hard is it to manage the different distribution channels? There's definitely challenges. They each kind of want something different out of you, whether the hardware stores want lots more marketing support and pretty packaging, better labeling, the things that make a big difference in their world for being able to sell the product. And they're kind of stuck in between a retail size product and a commercial size product. By that, I mean the grocery stores, you know, Walmart stores like that, they're going to sell mops and brooms that are relatively small and inexpensive, but the hardware stores want to sell something that's bigger and beefier, but it's still not quite as big and as industrial as our janitorial supply customers. So we had to adjust our product mix for that channel. And then 
you know, on the other side of it, our regular everyday janitorial suppliers, they don't want marketing support. They want a good price. They want on time delivery. They want to be able to buy things in bulk. So we definitely have to manage the different ways we do business with different customers, which is a challenge. Are you applying some different marketing strategies then to reach those different channels? We definitely do. Our Most of our marketing is aimed at the janitorial supply side of that business. It's mostly name recognition type marketing. So our industry still has some pretty active magazines that we advertise in. They are coming into the modern era with uh, email marketing and digital marketing of that sort that we're taking advantage of. But we're not really selling our products. We're selling our company. It's Zephyr Manufacturing, Made in America, high quality customer service, the things that make Zephyr unique in the industry. That's what we're advertising for those. For the hardware store channel, they like to do their own marketing. So a lot of it is um, you give them the kind of the information and the supplies and they're marketing directly to their customers to help get our products in more stores and to sell more product once it's in the store. So we're relatively hands-off on the marketing in that channel. We're not actively trying to add additional hardware distributors at this point, in which case, yeah, we would definitely need to market a little bit different to them. How important is your website in this whole mix? I think it's very important now. With a company as old as Zephyr, you get to see how they did it a long time in the past. We've had a catalog that we would design and print every couple of years, and we've got them going back really long time. So there's still customers of ours that we've had for a long time that want a paper catalog and they want something in their hands. But the world is definitely moving towards doing your own research, finding your own information and not waiting for somebody to send you a catalog with that information in it. So we actually stopped updating our catalog in 2016 and started to focus more on the website and all of the up-to-date information on product specifications and pictures and the things our customers want are, you know, the cubes and the weight and how many fit on a pallet and that sort of thing. All that information is on the website and up-to-date. So if there's something needs to be changed, we can change it instantly. We don't have to wait for a reprint of a catalog. You just go in and change a couple lines of code and everything's up to date. And we find a lot of customers look us up. They're checking out our website first before they do anything else. So it's very important. So 96 years in business is a long time. What do you attribute this success to? Over the years, there's been a lot of things that have led to the success. My grandfather and my father, they changed whole business models at certain points. It's funny how the world comes full circle because my dad actually moved the business from being somewhat focused on hardware stores and retail channels and took it into the commercial industrial channel. And then even further into that, there's a kind of a niche market of wholesalers that are larger customers that buy an even larger bulk, but they break our products and many others up and resell them to distributors that are either too small or don't want to buy as much or just kind of want a shorter lead time. So he went all the way deep into that channel. And now here I am 20, 30 years later, somewhat reversing the trend and going back and getting out of the industrial space as heavily and trying to diversify into other channels. And that's one thing is a relatively small family owned business. We're able to make those changes easily, quickly. There's not a whole corporate hierarchy and structure and shareholders that we have to worry about. It's just me and, and my team of managers and salesmen deciding what we think is best for our customers and what we think is best for our business at any given time. And we can make a change and we often do pretty quickly. That helps us. And then we have some core values as a company. We focus on made in America. That's our main thrust. We, of course, sell some items that are manufactured in other countries. It's pretty much unavoidable in this day and age. But the mops that we sell are almost primarily made in the United States. About 75% of the product that we sell is manufactured here. And that's a decision we made versus importing finished product from all over the world at what would ultimately be a lower price. But we're able to add a lot more value to our customers by manufacturing it here. We control the quality. We control the supply chain better. We can private label. We can do small runs. We're much more agile. Custom products are much easier to do when you're producing it instead of whenever you're importing it from overseas. So that's a big thing that I like to talk about is made in America. And the other thing is, is our customer service. We have highly trained people in the office 
And when you call Zephyr, you get a human on the phone. There's no phone tree. There's no leave a message. You get a person, they're going to take care of you. And they don't know how to do it themselves. They're going to track it down for you and they're going to get right back to you because we want to take care of our customers 100%. That's why we're here. How many of your competitors are able to say made in America? Very many? Here and there, a lot of our competitors have a mix of product and they'll sell some made in America. They'll sell some that's imported. And where that line is, is sometimes a little hard to tell. So unless you're a customer that's really asking and insisting on it, if it's a price driven decision, you're probably going to get the imported product. If it's a quality driven decision, you're probably going to get made in America product. And like I said, we do still sell some imported items that we have to have. And a lot of it is price driven economics. So I would say a lot of our customers are not as heavily made in America as we are, but I think a lot of them do still try to offer it. So are there other ways that you can differentiate yourself? Like I said, one thing that we do really push is our private label products. We have special printers to print the labels that go on all of our products And they're in line with the manufacturing process and we don't have a minimum on the number. So if they just want a couple of cases, as as long as we get the design of their label figured out, we can make them a couple of cases. It doesn't cost them any extra. There's no upcharge. A lot of customers like that because now the product that they're selling to their customers, it's theirs. It's got their phone number on it. If their customer wants to buy it again, they call them directly and then they can get repeat business on a high quality made in America mop. That is something that our competitors really can't offer. Yeah, that is a nice feature. So you compete in a very mature marketplace. Describe some of the challenges of trying to grow market share when things are so mature. Mops and brooms have been made for over 100 years, and there's not a lot of change in the market. The big changes now are consolidation, both with our customers and with my competitors. In the time since I started, which it will call that 15 years, there's probably been at least 20 of my competitors that have been bought up or gone out of business, consolidated in with somebody else, whether it was us, we've purchased a few, or one of my competitors. And our distributor customers are doing the same thing. There's a lot of consolidation. There's three or four very large companies in our channel that are buying distributors all over the country to create a national presence as an individual company, which is not an easy task for them to do. And they definitely can't open up their own branches in all these places. So as our list of potential customers get smaller and competitors, you know, get bigger. That's one of the biggest challenges we have now is trying to grow that market share with less targets. Uh, And sometimes, you know, your customer gets acquired and you lose that business. Sometimes you benefit from it. Sometimes you don't. And it's all about marketing and keeping your name out there and making sure the buyers in these companies know who you are And if you have a piece of business, that's where the customer service comes in because you got to keep it. It's way easier, way more cost effective to keep that piece of business than it is to get a, you know, the expense it takes to go get a new one. So we take care of those current customers like they're golden and make sure they're happy. And that's about it. Well, I'm assuming that you try to grow that business as well, moving them into compatible products or Mm -hmm. ancillary products that cause them to buy more from you. I know in our business, 75% of the new business we get each year is from our current customers that need an additional service, or they hear about something we're doing for somebody else and they inquire about that. Or we strategically come up with an idea that we think will work for a client, kind of like suggesting to you to go on and do the podcast in the digital space that you're going to be doing later on this year. Is that pretty true for yours as well? Yeah, absolutely. Another great service that Zephyr offers is call it consulting, but mops and brooms can be horribly complicated for as simple of a product as it really is. And for as simple of a task as it's going to do, we have an amazing variety of products. We sell over 1200 different SKUs, six or 800 of those are mops and brooms. So You wouldn't think that there's 600 different products you could make to clean your floor with water and soap, but we found a way and our competitors have too, which is what's driven the complexity of the product. So what we do with our customers is we make sure they have the right product mix, whether they need to buy more products or if they need to simplify their offering and they'll sell just as much or more 
with less inventory on the shelf. That's the kind of information we can help them derive because a lot of times products are very, very similar, slightly different size, slightly different material. They don't need to be carrying, you know, two, three items. They just need the one. And for them that clears up their warehouse space, they get to turn one item a lot more often than they turn three. And that's important to them. So a lot of times they also have gaps. They're selling mops, but they don't have a mop stick. And it's really hard to use one without the other. So we identify those gaps and those openings, and we make sure that our customers have the full offering so that their customers can buy everything that they need from one place. I can see where that could be very beneficial. So, you know, one of the challenges that I know that most businesses are facing today is workforce, having enough people, having enough good people, making sure they show up for work, show up on time. As a family owned business, do you feel like you have some advantages that you can offer an employee that maybe others can't? Yeah, you know, I think that there's a pretty big benefit to the fact that I am the owner of the company and my door is always open and I'm on the shop floor on a pretty regular basis. And I know all my employees by name and I can walk out and have a conversation with them. And if I need a certain product or uh, we're behind in a certain place and I'm trying to help out, I'll go out and have a conversation with them. And I think a lot of our employees really do appreciate that. If there's ever any issues with their job or anything like that, they know that they have access all the way to the top of the company. And there's no complicated HR protocols or big company politics or anything like that. There's just me at the end of the day. And I like to take care of our people. Even before it became extremely difficult to hire anybody, we wanted to take care of our employees. And I like to tell the story. We have one long-term employee who has been with us for 50 years and was actually hired by my grandfather. So has worked for three generations of my family in the same company, which is just amazing. And, you know, somebody's not going to do that if there's not something a little special or unique or at the very least a good job with a good company. Oh, I think that says a lot about your company and about your family. And just a simple thing, you mentioned it earlier about answering your phone versus using technology. And it kind of blows me away that so many people have gone over to, you know, IP phone or, or whatever technology they're using to have an automated phone answer because most people are frustrated by that. Mm -hmm. And yet it just has become, you know, kind of part of our business world that we live in. And, and so when you do answer the phone, yourself, not yours. Well, I bet you do answer it sometimes yourself. I do. Yeah. Yep. I mean, it really sets you apart from everybody else. Mm -hmm. When you're the boss, you get to do everything, don't you? <laughs> yes, absolutely. People are on lunch, the phone's ringing, I'm going to answer it. And sometimes uh, people are a little surprised that they got me on the phone, but that's kind of the, the thing we do. Like I said, we're not going to rely on technology for that service because I know how that feels on the other end, whether it's for work or for a personal reason. If, if I am at the point where I'm picking up the phone, it probably means I've already tried an email or your website or whatever customer service channel you want me to go through. I've already tried it and now I'm on the phone. And if I got to sit through five trees to get to a waiting queue to get on the phone with somebody that doesn't know my problem, it's very frustrating. We're not in the business of putting people through that process. They get us, they explain their problem, we fix it, you know, let's move on and let's, let's have a good business relationship. Super. So I want to talk a little bit about the personal side of your life and growing up and living and working in rural America. But before we make that transition... If there's somebody out there that's listening by chance that wants to become a customer of Zephyr or they just want to know more about Zephyr, how do they find you? The best way is our website. All the information is on there, www.zephyrmfg.com. So zephyrmanufacturing.com. All of our contact information is on there. All of our product information is on there. And then if you have any questions that can't be answered on a website, Give us a call. You might get me on the phone if you call at the right time. <laughs> they can only hope, right? Yeah. <laughs> We've known each other a long time. Been out to your house, barbecues, got a great place out in the country. Tell us why you like rural America. Born and raised here, lived in rural America my whole life. So it's really 
moved into a city and thought, I don't think I want to do this for the rest of my life with the traffic and how spread out things can be and just, you know, the speed of life. So, you know, what I like about rural America is it's a place where, you know, things slow down a little bit. You get to know all of your neighbors, all the people in town. Sedalia is an amazing community that really buckles down and helps itself out. So those of us that are lucky enough are always out in the community helping others. And there's always somebody out to give a lending hand, whether it's somebody in need or just somebody who needs help moving a couch. Rural America is a place where everybody's out there to help. And it's a great place to live. It's a great place to raise a family. I know you're busy at work. I know you're busy at home, but when you have some free time, how do you like to spend it? You know, the family and I, I've got wife and three young children. We love to go camping. We have a travel trailer that we take all over the place and our kids are involved in sports. So a lot of times we're camping near a baseball field or near a soccer field somewhere, but we get out and we enjoy nature and enjoy all of the wonderful scenery that Missouri and surrounding states have to offer and go do all that. And we drove up to uh, South Dakota last summer, enjoyed Mount Rushmore and the Badlands, spent a week enjoying all that beautiful scenery. And I also like to get out and golf when I can. That's getting harder and harder as the kids get busier and busier. We spend a lot more time doing things with the kids. So I'd say the main thing I do outside of work is enjoy being with my family. No better way to spend your time. Boy, the RV industry has just blown up through COVID. I know you've been camping for a long time, but that's an industry that's just really gotten big, hasn't it? It has. It's done a lot of changing just from my perspective, from the consumer side. We're on our third travel trailer, so we have been camping for 10 years plus. And the types of products that they have to offer, a lot more variety. They're coming up with some pretty neat ways to cram things into small spaces. But COVID also kind of brought out a lot of problems with that entire industry and the supply chain and and the quality of products that they put out. And our most recent camper, we've had more kind of quality issues with it than we did the other ones combined over a much longer time frame, just because I think it got put together really quickly <laughs> in a factory because that demand really did balloon. And I know a lot of them are making a whole lot more units than they used to. And it's a lot harder to find a good campsite in some parts of the country because there's a lot of people out there, which is, I think, a great thing overall. And over time, more people driving and seeing the sites around the country, a lot of state parks, a lot of national parks that have a lot to add more than just always going to the beach or, you know, flying to some destination. Great family experience. You mentioned the consumer side of things. I always think it's interesting to do a little bit of market research on my own. So I'll take this opportunity to do that. For RJ as a consumer, what is the best way for businesses to reach somebody in your demographic sector, we'll call it? So I'm... Um, in a very unique age group that is really crammed between a lot of different lifestyles, a lot of different marketing kind of models. How do you identify as a millennial or a Gen X or Gen Z? I just turned 40 within the last couple of months. And depending on who you ask, I could be in several different groups. So if you're trying to market something to me that I've never heard of before, you know, Facebook is still a good place to get me. Digital marketing still gets to me, but still watch, you know, sports on television. You sit through all the commercials doing that. There's several different ways to get to me. The one I use the most is probably email or Facebook. That's where you end up. It seems Facebook knows things about you that nobody else does. So the ads can get pretty targeted and pretty relevant. Yeah. Digital marketing is a curse and a boost in that regards. So what are the ways that they cannot reach you? What media would not be consumed by RJ Lindstrom? Oh, you know, I don't think I really read a magazine on a personal level anymore, even the ones that come to the house. And and if you're sending me a mailer to the house, just like a random car ad or something, it gets thrown away before I read it. And maybe one of my biggest pet peeves is unsolicited text messages, which have really become a bit of a problem these days. But that's a pretty quick way to get on my bad side is send me a bunch of text messages I don't want. It must be effective because they just keep doing it. Just kind of like cold calling too, is right? Yeah. Fundraisers calling you up. Yeah, and we'll figure out a way to block it all at some point. But Yeah, eventually. So what's ahead for Zephyr in the upcoming years? You've got a centennial anniversary coming up in 2027. What's ahead for Zephyr? You know, 100th anniversary, that's going to be a pretty big deal. Don't know exactly what that looks like just yet. I think I'll probably have to 
consult with you to figure out how best to celebrate that throughout the year. That is a big deal. And, you know, as far as the future for the business, we're still coming out of COVID to a certain degree and dealing with some of the ramifications of coming out of COVID and the supply chain and HR issues, that sort of thing. So our short-term goals are to get everything back on track as far as supply chain goes, get fully staffed and make sure we're taking care of our customers. And then we look at new markets and ways to grow from there. Well, we're excited to help you plan a 100-year anniversary celebration here in a couple of years. I've really enjoyed visiting with you today. I've learned a lot, and you've had some great things to share with our audience. What else would you like to share that do you think might be interesting or maybe inspiring? Well, the only thing I could think of really was I was very hesitant to come on your podcast. You've been asking me for quite some time to do so. And I always kind of said no, but now that I've done it, it's a very unique way to get out and kind of tell your story and talk about your business and maybe teach other people a little bit about you and a little bit about what you're doing out in the world. And I know in Sedalia and the surrounding areas, there's lots of family businesses and family farms in my industry. Lots of my customers, lots of my competitors and suppliers, they're all family businesses. And I just think it'd be good to encourage all of them to get out and, and tell their story kind of like I am today, because I think there's a lot of value in sharing things about these Family businesses, multi-generational family businesses, there's a lot to be learned. And while some people don't want to get out and advertise quite like this, I think it could be very beneficial for a lot of people to do so. Well, I think that's a great pitch. And yeah, everybody's got a story and they're all interesting. Yep. It's kind of what makes you know this particular podcast so enjoyable for me to do is just learning about people and how they got to where they are. Hey, RJ, I appreciate you being on the podcast today. Yeah. Thank you again, Cliff. Very fun being here. And thanks for having me. Uh, you're very welcome. Maybe we'll do it again sometime. Hey, folks, thanks for listening to OutDrive. I hope you've enjoyed our visit today with RJ Lindstrom, president of Zephyr Manufacturing. Come back again next week and I'll take you down the roads of rural America where it's heaven on earth. Thanks for taking a ride with us on OutDrive. This episode is complete, so head on over to eCallus.com for more insight. You can apply to help drive your business growth. And be sure to sign up for our free monthly e-letter, OutThink, for even more helpful content about marketing to rural America. Have a great day and keep on driving.